So welcome everyone. We're glad you can join us tonight. I see several, lots of people are still entering the, the lecture. So we might take another minute or two just to make sure we get some people in who are waiting. We're glad you're here and glad you could join us. It's been quite the year. We've had a good lecture series though. We, I've really enjoyed all of our lectures and it's been fun to have people from great distances join us, both watching us, asking great questions and also being lectures for us. So we really appreciate it. During the lecture tonight, if you have any questions um, down at the bottom, if you're on a computer down at the bottom, there's a little chat button. And if you type in there, I will try and watch the chat as we go through and I'll ask some of the questions for you um, that are that you put in the chat box. So welcome. Um, tonight we have Dr. Joseph Aguilar here. He is a member of San Altofonso Pueblo and currently serves as the Pueblo's Deputy Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. He received his PhD from the Department of Anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania, where his research focused on the archaeology of the Pueblo Revolt. So we're really excited to have you here with us today, Joseph. OK, my turn? Yeah. OK. I'll <laughs> hand it over to you. All righty. Um... Well, thanks everybody for spending a little bit of time with um, with me and the Historical Society this evening. Uh, thanks to the Historical Society for um, the invitation to, to do this, this talk uh, presentation. Um, so my name is Joseph Aguilar. Most people know me by my nickname, Woody. Um, so if you see me on the streets, you can just call me Woody. Um, I'm currently the Deputy Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for San Aldefonso Pueblo. Um, like Elizabeth said, I received my PhD in anthropology from the University of Pennsylvania out in Philadelphia uh, in 2019. Seems so long ago, but it was just a couple years or so ago. Um, and I, I I've, so the focus of my dissertation was the Pueblo revolt, um, the kind of Pueblo perspectives on the revolt um, and the archaeology of the revolt as it relates to Black Mesa, which is just outside my window here. I'm, I'm um, calling in from San Aldefonso Pueblo. So my background is in archaeology, been doing archaeology for oof, 20, 20 years or so now, it kind of dates me. Um, and I, I got my start in archaeology well, at, at UNM when I was an undergraduate um, student, but I got my start in archaeology uh, at Los Alamos uh, National Laboratory. So LANL um, has a, a cultural resources program, and I got my start in the program under uh, Brad Vieira, um, who's been a mentor of mine ever since. Um, Brad was the, um, the, actually the, after retiring from Lanol and going to another job, he found his way to the Pueblo at, uh, to, to become its um, inaugural uh, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. Um, so Brad and I helped create that office and that program. Um, so I, I have, I'm familiar with um, the history, the archaeology of Los Alamos and the Parido Plateau. Um, because of that connection uh, with uh, work at Los Alamos, but more importantly, um, it's because of my connections as a Pueblo person uh, from San Aldefonso Pueblo. So much of my understanding of the past um, and the history of this place we now know as Los Alamos or the Parido Plateau uh, stems from my upbringing as a, as a San Aldefonso person, a Tewa person. Um, so that's at the forefront of um, kind of my understanding of, of uh, the history, the archeology span of the Parido Plateau. Um, 
more recently, I've been doing a lot of museum work. Um, so it's kind of nice to talk about um, archaeology and a place that's near and dear to my heart, which is our ancestral homelands up here on the plateau. Um, some of the museum work that, I, that I've been doing um, stems from that same foundation as uh, my upbringing as a table person. I'm currently involved in museum projects with Mesa Verde National Park, with the School for Advanced Research, um, with the De Young Art Museum in San Francisco. Um, the Pueblo is also um, in the very infant stages of um, putting together a plan for a museum uh, here in San Aldefonso, which is um, really exciting. Um, so among the other hats that I wear, museums are, I, have, I wear many different museum hats. But tonight uh, I'll talk about um, my, or the, the, our Pueblo's connections to the Prairie Plateau uh, from a Pueblo perspective. So let me share my screen. Um, and I hope this goes off without any glitches. So can everybody see that? Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. Perfect. So this is a picture from, um, ah, a picture from uh, San Alfonso lands. This is, I was hunting up on the, um, our lands this past uh, winter with my nephew and um, just found this beautiful spot of the Parido Plateau looking down towards San Aldefonso Pueblo. You can see Black Mesa on the left um, and the kind of Rio Grande Valley, Pawaki, Sangre de Crystal Mountains over there to the south. And this portion, the entire par uh, Parido Plateau uh, San Aldefonso considers to be its um, not only its ancestral homeland, but its contemporary homelands. And I'll explain what that means and why there's no difference um, later on as we uh, get deeper into the discussion. Um, so like, like I mentioned, a lot of what how I'm informed about my work comes from my upbringing as a Tewa person, but it's also informed by archaeology. Um, but it's a, a kind of new way of doing archaeology that informs my way of thinking. Um, so I adhere to uh, indigenous archaeology and, and collaborative archaeology, really should be plural, indigenous archaeologies and collaborative archaeologies, because there's not really one way to do um, archaeology when it comes to uh, working with um, Native people. And what what Indigenous archaeology is really is a it's a decolonizing mission, meaning um, that it sets to deconstruct um, archaeology as a colonial practice. Um, so it really is a response to the colonial frameworks that um, have and continue to deeply influence institutions of knowledge and power. Um, so at stake for Native people, for public people in this endeavor are the inherent right to control and contribute to the production of knowledge about our cultures and histories, um, the inherent right to protect, preserve, and present our heritage on our terms, um, and the inherent right to present our own accounts of our history and past. So indigenous archaeology really stems from those understandings or those assertions of um, really what is tribal sovereignty. Um, so although collaborative and indigenous archaeologists both advocate um, for interaction with stakeholder values, knowledge, practices, ethics, and sensibilities, they differ on one central point. Indigenous archaeology identifies and privileges a very specific public, that be Native peoples. Um, so in, in George Nicholas's uh, now iconic definition of Indigenous archaeology, 
um, defined as archaeology with, by, and for indigenous peoples. Um, it's the by part that seems to matter most in this regard. Um, this rhetorical divergence, divergence, if you will, means that indigenous archaeology seeks to redress a particular colonial legacy through a political commitment to advancing Native scholars and scholarship. Um, what also informs my understanding of the past and uh, my understanding of the Pario Plateau and our ancestral lands is uh, tribal historic preservation. Uh, currently, as I mentioned, I'm the deputy tribal historic preservation officer for the Pueblo. Um, and these offices are really important tools uh, whereby which uh, tribes uh, can reassert uh, sovereignty over their heritage resources. Um, and more than just cultural, more than just offices that um, deal with cultural resource management or compliance issues, working with federal and state local agencies. Um, tribal historic pres preservation offices are establishing a presence uh, through the creation of these offices across communities across the across the nation. Um, so there's only maybe about 180 plus typos across the nation now. And as more tribes uh, reassert their um, their claims and assertions to ancestral lands, um, uh, these offices like they help to 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 push those kind of interests and values um, forward. Um, so the catalyst for the creation of San Alfonso's TIPO office actually, and TIPO, I'll, I'll call it TIPO for short, Tribal Historic Preservation Office, um, was a, well, is a relatively large uh, federal projects on, a project on San Alfonso lands, um, which is a result, which was a result of the, um, the Amat uh, water rights um, litigation, which lasted about 60 years. So you, some of you might be familiar with this. The, the Pueblo needed a way to um, um, handle the numerous various cultural resources issues that would result as um, would, would result as a part of the, the project with ground disturbing activities. Um, it's going to be a years long project. Um, and so part of the catalyst for the public creating this office was uh, so that the public could manage cultural resources on its lands. Um, the project also affects the lands of Nambe Pueblo, Pauaki Pueblo, Tasuki Pueblo, and um, other lands in between. Um, so, but this wasn't the only reason for, for the site. It was the catalyst for, for um, creating the office. Um, but the Pueblo took this action as a natural outgrowth of centuries of um, asserting control over its cultural heritage resources. This just allowed it to happen in more of an official capacity. Um, Mike Bremer, who you, many of you guys might know through your, through maybe other lectures or dealings with um, the National Forest Service currently is uh, the Pueblo's uh, tipo. And I think I saw him on this call. So just a little shout out to our tipo. So to begin um, the discussion of, of my understanding, a uh, Tewa understanding of uh, the ancestral homelands of San Alfonso, which include large portions of the Pario Plateau, I'll begin with an examination of the historical arc um, of the claims uh, our Pueblo has made to these lands, uh, the lengths our Pueblo has gone to assert and reassert that claim um, over the over centuries and decades, really, um, up to the present time, and some of the ways in which archaeology um, from an indigenous or a Pueblo or a Tewa perspective. Uh, can help people to understand those claims and to help um, strengthen those claims. So what you see on your screen is a map um, of San Alfonso's exclusive 
um, use uh, Aboriginal tidal lands. Um, this was filed by the Pueblo um, before the United States Indian Claims Commission um, in what is known as Pueblo de San Alfonso versus the United States, otherwise known as Docket 354. Uh, this was in 1951. Um, so this case was the last of the Indian Claims Commission cases to be settled. Um, I think it took, uh, so it was, uh, the settlement agreement was dated um, February 3, 2005. So if my math is right, that's just over 50, 50 years. Um, so the entry of final judgment was on November 8, 2006. And contrary to many Indian Claims uh, Commission settlements, San Aldefonso uh, did get lands returned to it, um, including some Department of Energy and Bureau of Land Management lands, um, and over 7,000 acres of the Santa Fe National Forest. Um, as a part of the settlement, agreements were reached with the National Park Service uh, to recognize the Pueblo's uh, ancestral ties uh, to Sankawi, um, which is a portion of Bandelier National Monument, and with the Bureau of Land Management to recognize the Pueblo's ties to a culturally significant area south of the Pueblo grant. Um, so the Bureau of Land Management um, uh, recognized those ties uh, to these areas. Um, so this map illustrates um, the exclusive use Aboriginal tidal area um, that was uh, determined by the Pueblos um, in the Indian Claims Commission case um, back in 1951. So this map is a map of present uh, trust lands of San Aldefonso Pueblo overlaid with um, other uh, jurisdictions. Um, so you can see the, the kind of bold black um, line um, on the left of the screen there that points to the historic ancestral domain. Uh, this is part of that original claim overlaid with uh, contemporary land jurisdiction. So you can see um, what San Alfonso uh, the land base of San Alfonso currently is much, much smaller than the original claim uh, made back in 1951. Um, so these lands are but a portion of the exclusive use Aboriginal title area um, uh, as determined back in 1951. Um, oral histories of the Pueblo uh, trace our origins from the Four Corners area of uh, of uh, the United States, um, generally known as the Mesa Verde region, um, south um, to the highlighted area west of the Rio Grande that encompasses the present day San Aldefonso um, sacred area reservation, uh, Los Alamos um, and Bandelier National Monument. Um, and then to a Pueblo, not really well known to many outside of San Alfonso, uh, known as um, uh, Perege, uh, Owinge, which is uh, just east of State Road 30 as you're headed down, headed towards um, Española, almost directly across um, the uh, current village of San Alfonso. Um, while a large number of agricultural lands inside the Pueblo Grant um, on the east side of the Rio Grande were patented to non-Indians through uh, operation of the Pueblo Lands Act of 1924, uh, San Alfonso used the previous, uh, the provisions of the act to reacquire more, more of that land, um, more so than any other Pueblos were, were able to do. Um, Edgar Lee Hewitt, famous archeologist in the Southwest, originally recommended that the entire, entire Parido Plateau be designated as a national monument. However, Bandelier National Monument as created in 1916 was limited to the main section of the monument, um, including Frijoles Canyon. It was not until 1932 that the Ottawa unit was designated as a separate parcel within the monument. Uh, this parcel included Ottawa Pueblo, Sankui, 
and the Mortendad Canyon cavates, um, which are now adjacent to San Ildefonso lands, um, all of which are ancestral to San Ildefonso. Um, in 1962, portions of the unit located to the north and west of Highway 4 um, were transferred to the, to the Department of Energy with lands containing Ottawa Pueblo and the Mortendad cavates. Uh, the Mortendad cavate trail was eventually closed to the public due to intensive visitation, um, security concerns, and trespassing on nearby tribal lands. Uh, lastly, Ottawa and the surrounding lands were transferred to the Bureau of Indian Affairs and in Trust for San Alfonso um, in 2011. Um, however, even, even before the arrival of the United States um, in New Mexico, San Aldefonso vigorously defended its lands, including its ancestral homes north and west of the Rio Grande, um, through proceedings brought by the Spanish protector of the Indies uh, concerning several requests for grants of San Aldefonso lands to Hispanic settlers. Uh, Pedro Sanchez, for example, requested a grant of the Western San Aldefonso lands. Um, in those proceedings, it was found that Pedro Sanchez had abandoned his grant by 1763. Although Mr. Sanchez was not, was not successful before the Spanish government, when the United States took over New Mexico um, and was obligated to recognize the property rights granted by Spain and Mexico, many strange things uh, turned up. Uh, Ramon V. Hill, claiming to have acquired the grant from the heirs of Pedro Sanchez, submitted the grant uh, for recognition by the United States. Um, unfortunately, it is likely that San Alfonso, um, uh, unlikely that the Pueblo even knew about this submission at the time. Um, so the Ramon V. Hill grant was confirmed by Congress in 1860. Uh, and when it was surveyed, it was over 31,000 acres in size. So just to go back and show you that portion, um, that's the, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but it's those lands to the kind of southwest of the uh, area outlined um, in bold. Um, in the 1930s, um, well, so the full story, it's a really interesting story. Um, could spend lecture two lectures talking about this, um, this case. Um, but it, the, the full story of the Ramon Vigil grant can be found in uh, Malcolm Ebright's book, uh, Land Grants and Lawsuits in Northern New Mexico. I think that's UNM Impress, like 1994 or so. Um, so in the 1930s, the Pueblo attempted to purchase the Ramon Vigil grant and had negotiated a purchase price. Uh, the United States refused uh, to allow the Pueblo to use its money to purchase the land on the ground that it would purchase it for the Pueblo. Uh, the grant was acquired by the United States for the benefit of San Alfonso, according to the deed. Um, however, it was purchased with monies from the Federal Emergency Relief Administration uh, through the processes uh, for distribution of lands acquired with those funds. Only about 6,000 of the 31,000 acres ended up as the 1949 uh, San Aldefonso sacred um, area, um, which is that little triangle of land um, that kind of cuts into uh, DOE lands there, um, west of State Road 4 in between DOE lands. So here's a little close up of um, that legend of the first map. So if you see on the top, the original um, Aboriginal claimed uh, area is just over 120,000 acres, um, you know, through a series of uh, legal events and, and other events, uh, that number has whittled down to the present day San Aldefonso Reservation, which is around just under 40,000 acres, I believe. Um, so you can see much, much smaller uh, portion than um, is originally claimed. So here, here's a visual aid um, that may help uh, understand why San Aldefonso 
has in the past and currently uh, made a claim to a large portion of the Parvio Plateau. Um, this mic was, this map um, was uh, put together by our TIPO, Mike Bremer, um, and it illustrates uh, the density of what are known as archaeological sites on the Parvio Plateau. Um, outlined in dark blue is the San Aldefonso ancestral uh, boundary. Um, outlined in kind of a darker maroonish brown color um, is the current San Aldefonso boundary. Um, so each one of those little red dots and blobs that you see on the map uh, represent individually recorded sites. Um, um, not just within the, the ancestral and um, current San Alfonso boundaries, but um, beyond. Um, at best, um, there's probably around two to 300 sites on national forest lands, which are kind of um, west and north of current San Alfonso lands um, on DOE. Um, Pretty from, I'm very familiar with the, the sites and the site density on, on Department of Energy lands. The number of sites there uh, probably runs in the 2,500 range. Um, and just on Bandelier alone, there's uh, over 3,000 sites. Um, if you look a little closer at the map, you see large areas of San Aldefonso lands um, that are devoid of any red dots and blobs. Um, that's just because San Aldefonso hasn't engaged in any intensive archaeological surveys uh, on its lands. So were those lands to be surveyed, um, the site density would be much, much greater. So most of these places, you know, on, on the map, they just look like red dots and red blobs and they represent archaeological sites. Um, but what they really represent are traces of where San Aldefonso people uh, once lived. Uh, but more importantly, they represent the connection that our Pueblo has with this important landscape. More than just archaeological sites on a landscape, these sites are the physical manifestations of our connection to the land. Um, and the cultural manifestations of that connection are what we see in contemporary San Aldefonso culture. So as Pueblo people, we engage with the ancestral landscape much in the same way we as, um, uh, much in the same way that our, our ancestors engaged with the cultural landscape. Um, and it's very much the ancestral landscape and what we know and the way we use the contemporary landscape are very much the same. Um, so there's no disconnect between the distant past and the present. So that might be a little confusing. So to help kind of understand that idea, um, I'll take a little, I'll talk a little bit about my own approach to understanding the past. Um, how that relates to my research and its implications for San Aldefonso, Pueblo, and our connections and claims to um, the Parvido Plateau. So in, in my own work, I take a place-based approach to understanding the past, which emphasizes the interdependence of time, space, and history. So my starting point is the idea that places embody uh, history, both physically and spiritually, and that historical memories are given life when people re-encounter these places. Um, so by the mere fact of um, public people in visiting places on the landscape, their, these places are given, uh, given back some life. Um, so this place-based uh, perspective is essential for a more holistic understanding of the past and cultural landscape and landscapes uh, in a couple of ways. Uh, first, a uh, place-based approach embraces the strong link that Pueblo and other indigenous peoples maintain with their past. 
uh, for Pueblo people, there's no disconnect between place and time. The contemporary world and that of our ancestors are embedded in the same place. Um, it is this reality that generates their or our continuing attachment to these places. Uh, second, a uh, place-based perspective furthers the aims of uh, an indigenous archaeology um, by rejecting the false dichotomy between history and prehistory um, and the implicit assumption that places of history are linked to entangled European and indigenous encounters while places linked exclusively to an indigenous past are part of prehistory. So part of my approach is blurring or completely erasing that line between history and prehistory and taking a kind of more holistic or collective view of the past that doesn't break it down into that, those segments. Excuse me. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't explain the map. Um, so these are, these are maps that were created by uh, Sam Dewey. He's an archaeologist at um, the University of Oklahoma. He's done a lot of work here in um, uh, northern New Mexico. I worked with him at Los Alamos. Um, uh, he does some work up here in northern New Mexico. So this is a map of the four um, peaks that kind of define uh, the Tewa, the Tewa world, for lack of a better term. Um, so each peak um, highlighted here in red um, is recognized by each of the Tewa Pueblos, um, and it defines that uh, our cosmo, cosmo, cosmological or cosmographical world, if you will. Um, and so thanks to Sam for providing uh, these maps for his own work and um, some of the work that I've done. As you move in closer um, uh, to each Pueblo on that bigger map, um, each Pueblo is kind of a microcosm of that bigger uh, landscape that's defined by the sacred mountains. So instead of each Pueblo having a sacred mountain um, that bounds their Pueblo, they have um, a, a mesa in each cardinal direction. Um, so for San Aldefonso, for example, um, Black Mesa or Tunio um, is the cardinal mesa uh, for the north. Um, so the, the mesas located in the cardinal directions, um, they're, they're venerated for lots of different reasons. Um, so that's why I, I choose to understand uh, sites on the Paru Plateau in the same way that um, my Pueblo understands uh, its local landscape. So for example, um, some of these, uh, some of our ancestral villages on the plateau, um, like Ottawi, Sankawi, uh, Navawi, Nakamu, Zirige, um, likely define their local landscape much in the same way that San Alfonso or Santa Clara um, or Tasuki might define their local landscape today. Um, and if you were to stand really on any kind of high point on the Parido Plateau, just look around, um, you'll likely see Truchas Peak or, um, or Sandia Peak or uh, Kanhilong Peak, which are the, the bounds of the Tewa world as seen in this map here. Um, and I've, I've, I've done this a lot when I, when I worked for uh, LANL and DOE out on survey. I'd come to a high point, I'd look around and I'd look at the view shed and I could easily see many of these sacred um, peaks. Um, and I and I imagine, uh, if you would, um, that these pueblos or these places where I was standing 
um, view their landscape in the way that we as contemporary San Alfonso people view their landscape. Um, and just given the cultural, cultural traditions that um, uh, uh, I grew up with, um, have I, I feel pretty strongly that um, the landscape was viewed um, in the same way. So with these maps, I attempt to illustrate um, that, that connection um, to the landscape. So as it relates to, to my work, um, my, my own dissertation work and my, my research on the Pueblo Revolt, um, I trace the movements of Pueblo people from their villages on the Rio Grande um, to some of their ancestral homes on the Parito Plateau. Um, so while the focus of archeological investigations on the Pueblo Revolt period uh, tended to focus on um, the Mesa top villages, um, Pueblo people, San Alfonso people in particular, in this case, sought refuge in lesser known locations across the Pueblo landscape, including previously um, occupied ancestral homes not mentioned in the historical records. So mobility was a key crucial, was a, a key resistance strategy um, during the Pueblo revolt period. Uh, and the breadth of the ancestral Pueblo landscape provided a means through which public communities could seek um, strength, spiritual strength, and protection by taking defensive um, stances on these um, um, ancestral villages um, on the Parallel Plateau. Uh, unfortunately, um, there's been a tendency to focus on the obvious Mesa top settlements like Tunio or um, um, some of the other um, uh, revolt Mesa villages in the Cochiti or Jemez areas, um, which have led many historians and archaeologists to overlook uh, other upland and lowland areas that were key components um, in conjunction with the Mesa top villages um, in a Pueblo resistance strategy. So um, numerous previously occupied ancestral villages were occupied by Pueblo people following the Pueblo revolt. Um, but many, many of these have yet to be identified by archeologists um, just because we don't know where they are or where, where people went uh, doesn't mean that these places don't exist. Um, in seeking evidence of these people and their relations, um, we could benefit from paying closer attention um, to later ceramics present at many classic, uh, what, are, what, what are commonly called classic uh, period villages, um, like Ottawi, Sankawi, um, Navawi, um, on the Pari Plateau. Um, the archeological documentary and oral, oral historical evidence all suggest that San Alfonso and Santa Clara people sought protection at their ancestral villages at places like Navawi, Sankui, Ottawi, and Puye, um, and at some of their associated cave eight complexes. So although well known to descendant Pueblo communities today, these reoccupied ancestral homes are less familiar to archeologists concerned with the revolt area, since much of the attention has been focused on the Mesa Top and Mission villages. Uh, these ancestral places served uh, an important role in the revolt era um, settlement system. Uh, they were lesser known, if at all, uh, to people who were adversaries of uh, uh, public people during the revolt era, uh, namely Don Diego de Vargas and his allies. So thus they were out of the scope of the 1694 um, through 96 military campaign of Don Diego de Vargas um, and provided additional safe havens to supplement the fortified Mesa villages like Tunio. Um, in conjunction with the Mesa top village and mission, mission villages, these reoccupied ancestral villages uh, rounded out a strategic settlement system that was crucial to survival during their resistance to Vargas's reconquest in the 1690s. 
Uh, some of the common characteristics of some of these village, villages include their relatively short um, occupational histories during the revolt era um, and the lack of any further long-term occupation following the tumultuous years of the Pueblo revolt period. Um, these aspects allow archaeologists to investigate the village architecture relatively unobscu unobscured by previous or later occupations. Another often unemphasized aspect um, of all these revolt era settlements is the deliberate choice um, of Pueblo people um, to occupy places because of both their spiritual significance um, as places occupied by their ancestors and their usefulness as strategic and defensible locations. Um, so places like um, Nakamu on the left, which is deep, deep in uh, DOE lands, um, which is a coalition period Pueblo, uh, originally dated roughly to about 1300 or so. Um, and Navui um, on the right, which is a, a classic, what we call, what archaeologists call a classic period Pueblo, um, dating to around the 1400s or so. Um, these places um, were reoccupied during times of the Pueblo revolt. Um, it's where people not only sought um, defensible places like strategic holdouts, but these were places where their ancestors once lived before. Um, so going back to these places not only provide a strategic kind of military advantage, but it provided that kind of um, uh, spiritual um, kind of safety, if you will. Um, what's also really fascinating about these villages um, is their remarkable, remarkable documentation in the ethno-historic record, often glimpsed through the actions of Spanish authorities who strove to constrict public agency and sovereignty. Um, so by parsing out the documentary record, uh, we're able to trace the movements of people to and from these villages as a means of understanding mobility strategies, um, indigenous diplomacy, and the forging of political alliances. So coming to an end, um, my approach to understanding the past uh, stems um, from this landscape approach uh, that integrates Pueblo Indian philosophy, indigenous archeological theory and practice and tribal cultural heritage management principles in order to create an indigenized or Tewa history of all our ancestral lands, including those um, on the Parvio Plateau. Uh, the merging of these inherently indigenous aspects to understanding the past from a landscape perspective um, that is informed first and foremost by indigenous ways of knowing and doing um, can only complement um, conventional or Western uh, or scientific ways of understanding the past. Um, so I'd be happy to take some questions um, if there are any from the audience. I haven't been paying attention to the kind of chat chat area, but um, Elizabeth or yeah, if anyone can help me field questions, if there are any, I'd be, be happy to. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the talk. If you have a question, please um, type it in the chat and um, we'll ask a few questions. So the first one is, it was early in your talk, someone asked, what is your name for the Sangre de, Sangre de Cristos? And I think there, you have the Tewa words for some of the mountains. And I didn't know if there's a, a word for the mountain range is probably what they're asking there. Yeah, I don't, I don't think public folks view um, uh, mountains or, or landscapes in, in the same way that um, non-public folks do in terms of ranges. Uh, we, we tend to see the, the peaks themselves. And while we do have names for other peaks um, within the Sangre de Cristos, the one that I provided, um, Gusang, is the name for what is known, commonly known as Chucha's Peak. Okay. Um, someone asked if the last picture was Black Mesa. And then 
Also, what claim do the Cochiti people have on the Parito Plateau? Is there a definite boundary? So I, I, I can't speak to the claims that Cochiti people have to the Parito Plateau, um, but I can talk a little bit about um, what's been called a boundary um, between, I guess, the Keras to the south and the Tewa to the north. Um, and the idea of this of this boundary mostly comes from anthropological or archaeological understandings of the of what's now known as Bandelier National Monument. Um, the, the the common understanding is that Frijoles um, uh, Canyon, where Bandelier National Monument proper is right now, serves as that um, traditional boundary with Keras folks to the south and Tewa to the north. Um, but I tend to think of a boundary, if any exists at all, as something more blurred, um, not hard lines as, as we understand them today in contemporary geopolitical terms, I guess. Um, because you know there was no fence there back in the, back in time, so there was probably some kind of mutual understanding of a boundary that doesn't adhere to uh, contemporary Western understandings of what a boundary is. <laughs> were the sites that were reoccupied during the Pueblo Revolt era in such a state that they needed to be rebuilt for occupation after the two hundred to three hundred years since they were previously occupied? So when they moved back. Yeah, it's, it's, it's likely that the, the places were, were maybe not quite suitable for living as, as they found them. So I imagine there had to be a, a level of kind of rebuilding um, at those places. Uh, but these places included, um, you know, masonry villages like Nakamu, um, which perhaps was one of the last occupied uh, villages um, in that area. Um, so it may have been that the architecture was suitable for reoccupation, um, coupled with its location as a kind of really um, a strategic kind of location on the, on the finger of a mesa. There's, there's probably lots of different reasons why people chose to go back to those places. Um, other places that were reoccupied were caveats, which um, depending on their natural state of erosion, require virtually no uh, reconstruction. What is the relationship between the ancestral and contemporary homelands of San Aldefonso and Santa Clara? Uh, I, I'd probably answer similar to the kind of uh, the, 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 the boundary question between Cochiti and, and San Aldefonso. Again, there's, there's a, a mutual understanding between Pueblos that doesn't require um, uh, hard, hard boundaries. Mm -hmm. I mean, now, of course, we're, we're forced to adhere by those, by those jurisdictions um, because we all have different interests in, in our lands and the landscape. Um, but traditionally, th those lands are still in many ways um, kind of used mutually in a lot of ways. Any other questions? If you have any, if anyone else has a question, feel free to type it in. So I, I believe I once heard that um, we have a, the concentration of ancestral sites here on the Parido Plateau um, is more, I guess there's, there's a greater concentration than almost anywhere else in the United States. Is that true? Yeah, that's, that's, that's true in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, you saw, you saw the map um, oh, yeah. earlier of, of all the, um, of all the sites uh, on the Parido Plateau. Um, and that doesn't include areas on um, the Los Alamos town, town site that are now parking lots and buildings and apartments and homes. So we're missing a lot due to kind of recent um, kind of historical uh, 
because of recent historical circumstances. Um, so what you see on the on the map uh, could be amplified um, in magnitude. Just um, I mean, because we don't we don't know what was there before. Right. Right. Um, someone's asked to give me a better northern New Mexico map in my head of the four mountains you showed us is the farthest northwest one as far north as just above Trace Piedras. Yeah, that's about right. And the Canhillon area, uh, yeah. Canhillon Peak. Okay. Um, and, and that's the, the map I presented. It's, it's, um, it, <sighs> It's it's not what we would define as our only as our ancestral homelands because um, I mentioned early on in in the in the talk that uh, we have ties that go all the way to the Four Corners area um, and beyond. Um, it's just that contemporary um, uh, Tewa pueblos kind of view the world in this particular way. That doesn't exclude. Um, lands outside of those, um, that, that uh, what you would call those Tewa, four Tewa peaks. Again, it's not the boundary, right? Yeah. Yeah, not a boundary. That, it's that idea of not having a boundary, really. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. um, people said, great presentation. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, can you comment on the relationship between nuclear waste contamination and sacred sites? <laughs> uh, uh, where do but you begin? You want to go there? I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, part part of the reason why I got into um, archaeology was because of my experiences as a as a child with our lands on San Ildefonso Pueblo and the Department of Energy lands um, adjacent to our lands. So the the map I showed you with that what's called the sacred area that little triangle of land wedged between the Department of Energy is where I would go as a kid with my grandpa, my uncles. Um, we'd go hunting there, we'd go haul wood there, but we could only go a certain distance. And I, I could, as a child, I, I never understood why we couldn't go beyond a certain canyon or why there was a fence there or why there were signs that said, um, you know, Department of Energy, whatever the sign said back then, they probably said something similar to what they say now, um, area under the jurisdiction of the Department of Energy or so forth. And I was wondered like, why do we have to stop here? Why can't we go further? All the while I learned from the people that I was with on these excursions, hunting, wood gathering, resource gathering, um, about places on the landscape. I, my grandfather, for example, would point out a small field house or a big plaza village. And he would explain to him, to me in his terms, what these places were. And logically as a kid, I'd be like, there's more of these places on the other side of that fence. Um, and that really sparked the interest in me to and I, I didn't realize it till much later, um, really, till I was like a sophomore or junior in college, kind of lost, not knowing what major to pick. Um, I was drawn to anthropology because it was the one discipline that uh, spoke about um, ancestral places in a much deeper way than any other discipline, more so than history, um, more so than any other discipline. Um, so that that engaging with those those classes and undergraduate uh, work brought back those experiences as a child. And what I do now today in in my work as a historic preservation is is to address all those issues of nuclear waste and contamination um, and sacred sites as they relate to DOE um, and San Ildefonso because we're the only tribe in the nation um, that shares a border with uh, uh, um, uh, a facility such as Los Alamos National Laboratory. So these issues are very real to us. Um, have the sites on 
DOE and BLM land been documented and are there protections of those sites by LANL? Yeah, so LANL and BLM, they, they both have fairly robust um, cultural resources programs um, that protect uh, those types of sites. Um, when I was working at the, the what LANL, uh, there was large swaths of land that weren't surveyed. Um, so part of what I did um, after the Cerro Grande fire, after um, as a part of other projects was survey previously unsurveyed lands to document these sites. So I don't know what the numbers are now for DOE, but um, there's probably a small percentage of lands that still haven't been surveyed. Mm -hmm. Have archeological finds turned up with the development of Los Alamos and returned to the Tewa? And if things are found now, who should be notified? That's well, the, the <laughs> San Alfonso should always be notified of any um, archaeological findings, whether it's um, through development or whether it's just uh, by folks out on a hike somewhere in these open areas, which are um, inherently San Alfonso lands, but perhaps now that that are now under the jurisdiction of, say, Los Alamos County or the Department of Energy. Um, so I'd, I'd advise any, any people out there who come across things, whatever those things might be, to either leave them alone or um, should you feel the need, contact the contact, um, Department of Energy or San Alfonso Pueblo to start the proper process for kind of dealing with these types of findings. And then, of course, Sean Evans is asking the question I was going to ask you off offline after this <laughs> after this uh, presentation. Um, as San Aldefonso opens a museum on its land, what opportunities are there for partnership with the National Park Service and the Historical Society for sharing a more inclusive history and future? I, I, that's a really good question, Sean, and I think um, <laughs> I think those opportunities, they, they certainly don't exist now, right? Um, there's no uh, partnerships um, in, in any official capacity for um, the interpretation um, of a more inclusive uh, history and future. Um, I mean, there's, there's some relationships that um, the Pueblo has established with Bandelier, like really good working relationships, but to, to partner with the Kind of interpretive side of things um, to present a more inclusive history. I, I think it's only a good thing. So I would hope that the Pueblo and the Park Service and the Historical Society would entertain um, such partnerships in the future. I think it'd be mutually beneficial. Good that's question, true. Sean. I think that's absolutely true. Um, I'm excited for you to open a museum. I think that's that'd be fantastic. So that would open, I think, some really nice opportunities for us to talk to each other get together. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that might be the last question. But uh, thank you again for the presentation and we should definitely keep in touch. Um, let us know. Oh, Jeff wants to know if that last picture was Black Mesa again. Uh, yeah, that was, um, that was taken from the top of the Mesa, um, during my, uh, dissertation fieldwork, um, uh, kind of looking, uh, west towards, uh, Los Alamos area, Pario yeah. Plateau area. Yeah. Um, make sure you keep in touch with us and tell us more about the museum as it gets going. We'd love to hear more about it. People are asking how they can find out more about that. So definitely keep us um, yeah, there's not too much yeah. to tell right now about the museum, other than we have, um, it's a re really exciting time for the Pueblo in this um, kind of planning planning phase. Um, so we're just looking forward to how it all pans out and it's, it's going to be good, I'm hopeful. Jeff says he liked that picture because he'll never get up there. So it was, <laughs> it was fun to see a picture from, the, from Black Mesa. Um, thank you. Um, with gratitude for sharing and help us to understand another thank you. Lots of people saying thank you. 
So we appreciate your time and energy and effort to um, present to us tonight and stay in touch. Thank you, everyone, okay. for tuning Thanks in. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in and listening to what I have to say. Hope uh, it was informative. Thank you.